I'm loving the pop off. What's good? Welcome back to the Pop Off Podcast, a conversation show about the bear. Season three, episodes six through ten, and kind of the burden of expectations. I'm Ralph Campiano. I'm your host, and I'm joined by Jack Turner and Nick Bordenero, our resident chef in the Pop Off Pod roster, our culinary expert. You know, we've been texting about this show the last couple of weeks. Uh, Hulu does an interesting thing with FX where they release everything at once. So it's kind of hard to have a conversation with your friends about the show because you don't know where everybody's at, right? This isn't a weekly episode release where it's really easy to talk about House of the Dragon or the boys with your boys because it's like we're all on the same schedule. But with the bear, Turner, you just finished it. Bordy, I think you wrapped up about a week ago along the same timeline as me, right? So I'm curious, Bordy, Turner and I already talked about the first half of the season. What was your impression of the first half of the season? Uh, was Did you have the same issues that some other people had? Were you loving it all the way through? What are just your overall thoughts on one through five? So I think you guys did a great job in the one through five episode, kind of explaining things and going into depth and uh, giving the bear its flowers. But a lot of people don't agree with how we feel about the show. A lot of people were confused by the first episode and the compilation of things, but I know you two love a compilation, so it didn't bother y'all. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to follow at times. I feel like they tried to do a lot this season. And for me, it worked. If it didn't work for you, that's fine. But uh, I think it's a brilliant show uh, when you take into account the dialogue, the character development, and it just makes you kind of care about all these uh, chefs living in Chicago. Turner, uh, initial impressions on the second half of the season. You just finished the finale. Yeah. What are you thinking about six through 10 in comparison to one through five? I looked it up. The Rotten Tomatoes, not that Rotten Tomatoes is the end all be all. Uh, but the, you know, the critics had it at 90%, you know, sort of, that's pretty much certified fresh, but the audience score 54%. So, you know, there's definitely a disconnect between, uh, your you know day to day viewer and what a lot of the critics think and I think they did take a, a really big leap this season in terms of kind of what they were trying to show. Uh, the back half, I didn't think it was as strong as the front half personally for me, uh, but I think that's also due to the fact that you know it hits you with the to be continued. It did feel like kind of like part one of a twenty episode season more than a full season itself there was really no conclusion to a lot of the problems um that we're seeing with these characters and their lives uh, it didn't really feel like a clean wrap of a season uh and it makes a lot more sense too when you think that they filmed you know season three and four back to back we're gonna get season four uh within the next 12 months not like house of the dragon where you're waiting 24 months damn near so um like you just said i just finished like five minutes before you before we hopped on. So still digesting my thoughts a little bit, uh, but it's just phenomenal TV at the end of the day. Uh, and maybe it got a little artsy and a little convoluted at times this season, uh, but like the score, the shots, the panos of the city, uh, a lot of that stuff I just adore. The the effort and time they put into the food, you know, that they're crafting. Like they don't cut corners on this show. Uh, and with a lot of like streaming shows or shows where you see them, you know, release 10 episodes all at once. It's all about finishing the last episode with a cliffhanger to get you onto the next one. They just want you to binge that shit, but they don't really care about the underlying quality. Um, I felt like this was a little bit, this season as a whole was a little bit less binge worthy than the other seasons. I didn't have that same amount of like, Oh my God, I need to stay up all night and keep watching this. And I don't know if that's because of the sterile of the kitchen um, or the characters, you know, being a little, there was maybe a little less heart this season in some ways. Um, and maybe that's a knock, but Overall, I still really enjoyed this season, and I'm, I'm pumped for season four, uh, but it was definitely left with a little to be desired in terms of wrapping up some of the storylines. Yes. So your point about them not cutting around corners, this season they didn't cut any corners. If anything, they slowly jogged around corners. And I think that's the primary issue that I'm having with it is that I can't get out of my mind that this show was originally concepted as three seasons of TV. When Christopher Storer originally mapped it out, it was going to be three seasons of television. And because of money and scheduling and maybe scripting, Reed, maybe? it would have just been easier. 
year, greed, it would have been more profitable for them to do four seasons. And so I can't get that out of my head. And the one episode that I look at that's like that is the the episode that's like a signifier of that condition is Ice Chips. The eighth episode where, you know, Natalie Shug is going through her pregnancy. She's delivering a baby. And instead of spending five to ten minutes on that, we spend a grueling 32-minute panic attack-inducing episode with her and Jamie Lee Curtis and her return. And that's what I find fascinating about these last five episodes is that's probably my least favorite episode of The Bear by a country mile. I don't even know what the second, my second least favorite one would be. But at the same time, episode six and episode nine specifically, those are two of my favorite episodes. So it felt like it was a little bit more roller coastery for me as a watcher. But at the same time, I'm like, you're right. This is the best crafted show on TV. I don't think there's an argument there. It's just so purposeful and intentional. We do have a deep emotional care attachment to these characters. But like, I would have just liked to spend more time with Cousin Richie this season. And that's just like, we talked about how, and I think that's what it is. It's like, we're spending so much, there's so many lingering moments just on Jeremy Allen White as a physical performer in this season of TV, where it's just him and his big hair and his stale face, 40, your young Al Pacino comp, I think really resonated with me while I was watching the season of TV, but I'm like, can we subtract, you know, 25 seconds of those long 90 second sequences that we spend just with Jeremy Allen White's face and maybe get some more yeah. Richie jokes pushed in there or some more. That facts, episode was called called Blue Chips. We should get one called Blue Eyes because we're just staring into his deep blue yeah. eyes half the season. <laughs> and I think it was kind of intentional. They want us as an audience to kind of feel the same same stagnation Jeremy is stuck in, kind of just day to day not really feeling like you're accomplishing anything. They said they're not making money with the bear. The beef's making all the money uh, selling the beef sandwiches during the day. So not a lot happened per se. I think that kind of part of the point, everybody is kind of stuck in a rut a little bit with this new restaurant, just because it's not fun. It's not fun. Like the bear used to, or the beef used to be. Um, (laughs) It's not nearly as fun. It's not as comedic. It's none of those things. You're right. Uh, are we going to do episode by episode like you guys did? Because uh, I loved. Well, I think that's six. the perfect transition, yeah. Bordy. Yeah, episode six, like that is the flashback episode where we see Tina and her journey. And that's what I mean. That's my favorite episode of the season by far. I loved this episode. And that's the one you had. Tina's just that's such a the one you had trouble through the first time. You know, it's just I feel like they didn't pander much this season. It was just really they didn't care if you had fun watching it. They will make some good TV. The T the Tina episode felt like the least amount of homework watching it, right? Like it was it had the soul, it had like com- some of the comedy. She's a great performer. Um, Bernthal is just absolutely incredible, reprising his role, just stealing the show. And then you you get like a flashback to like I think we like the character development of Richie, right, and becoming a little bit more mature. Uh, but it's great to see him just slinging beefs, cussing people out, at, like you know, just working that charismatic at the front. Like as a viewer, that is a little bit more entertaining at times uh then you know the more of the reformed richie that we get to see uh it's still rewarding but he's still like the same charming richie like he gives a free beef to tina in that episode it's like oh he's always been a little bit of a sweetheart it's just that this environment that he's grown up in it's like it's the nature versus nurture thing um and that's like that's fun right like that part of the episode is really fucking fun even in i think it's episode seven when um Ibra gets some help at the beef. Like oh, they those, rehire those yeah, two dudes characters. to come in. They're a blast. Mm-hmm. They're smoking cigs, mm-hmm. wearing leather jackets, like talking about like, okay, these motherfuckers don't need mayo because if they put mayo on the sandwich, then they can ruin it themselves. Like mayo doesn't belong on Italian beef. I love mayo, but I'm never putting it on an Italian beef. Bordy, I actually wanted to ask you this. Like you're in kitchens, you know, you are a part of a family restaurant that's been successful for years, decades even. And you guys have one of the best pizzas in the Midwest. Thank you right? If you were to go away from that and try to like, let's say you have a cousin come in from New York and he spent time at like these fine dining experiences. Are you, are you going to be receptive to his idea to have like an elevated Italian cuisine place and then just have boardies out the back? 
or is that something that you would naturally be like, dude, fuck you. Like we make money doing this. We have it down. People love us. People respect us. Like take your idea elsewhere. Or do you think that you would be receptive to a car me coming into your life like this? I mean, definitely not receptful of changing something like the beef or like our restaurant that's been around. Um, you're the common person and not just a bunch of like liberal pussies that are going to like <laughs> pick apart your like Wagyu or Bay or whatever the hell you're making. Like I get it. And uh, a lot of people kind of shared the same sentiment. Like if somebody, some douche fuck came back from the French laundry and took over my Ita local Italian beef shop, I'd be pissed. Like I would hate this dude. Yeah. Um, but it's a TV show, you know, it's not supposed to be realistic. Um, a lot of people that I know cooks and uh, other people in the restaurant uh, industry kind of turned off by how unrealistic that is, what you brought up, like something like that happening, but you just got to understand it's a TV show. Um, it's meant to entertain. And uh, there's still plenty of Italian beef shops around to fornicate with a hot yeah. beef sandwich. Yep. You get the side window. I agree. I think like two things that would help, right, is that he's in the family. Um, you know, that's a benefit. He's not like a rando. And then two, you got, you know, the death of kind of the main owner or protagonist of the original beef. The right? heart, yeah. Um, like, I don't know, Manhattan Deli, right? It's not uh, the original owners, the Hansons, but they still, they're doing it right. And you, you love to see like the tradition prevail on like the local, kind of the local spots. If already I don't know if 40 agrees or not, but <laughs> yeah, we're not insulting Manhattan Deli on this podcast. They need our, uh, our contributions. Um, I want to go to episode seven. So this is the episode where Com Carmi goes to the AA meetings that this is our first time seeing him in the setting this season. Um, and then he also, I mean, it's called legacy, right? And this is the conversation where he's talking to, I think it's Marcus and Sydney. And they're talking about what kind of legacy they want to leave. And the words that came out of Carmi's mouth were maybe not hypocritical, but just like the least self-aware words ever. Like when he said the legacy I want to leave behind for my kitchen is peace, yeah. calm, <laughs> resolve. And it's like, dude, do like, have you looked in a mirror at all oh, yeah. recently? Like there's like, like these are bright, shiny cabinets in your guys's kitchen. Like you should be able to see the reflection of your fucking 19th forehead vein popping out like PD at like at a basketball scrimmage. Like it's just ridiculous. Like he's just constantly bursting. What did you guys think about that conversation about legacy? And do you guys like, you know, Turner work well, boardy worker for boardies? Like, do you guys think about your legacy often? Is that something that crosses your mind? Was this relatable part of TV for you? How I relate to Carmi is uh I can't really like see myself being a dickhead. I'm like, I'm not a dick, you know. Like, I think I'm a Sid, but my employees would probably consider me more of a Carmi. Uh, just because it's frustrating, you know, you, you get in the weeds and you're in the shit and you get pissed. You yell at people, but you're not yelling to make people upset. You're yelling to get the best out of your coworkers and your teammates, you know. Um, legacy wise, I don't know what the hell Carmi's talking about. I think he just wants a star. And yep, I don't know. If he's trying to prove something to Claire, prove something to himself, prove something to Joel McHale, but uh, Joel McHale for sure. Yeah, he, he's just kind of BSing a lot of people right now, and uh, Sydney's not having it. They so, could have made Carmi a, a little bit more likable at times. I think this season, uh, and I think that's also part of the reason why the audience score dipped. The past two seasons, you're really rooting for Carmi, and this season it's just a little harder because he's kind of being a jackass most of the time. Uh, and I'm, I'm sympathetic and empathetic to Carmi because obviously he's dealt with a bunch of bullshit uh, throughout his entire life. Like we've met his parents, we've met his family life. We've saw what happened to his brother. Um, we saw some of the, I don't know if you want to call it abuse. Cause it was definitely like self de decided to go and work in these restaurants and try and get better. Like that was a decision he was making. Uh, but obviously there's still trauma built up in calluses and you can kind of see him turning into Joel McHale's character a little bit at times uh, himself. Uh, so I think some of the legacy bullshit, I liked it more when uh, we were hearing it from um, Marcus and kind of like what he was wanting. He was a little bit more honest, I think, and, and his legacy. Uh, 
but that's always where I give Carmi some credit too as a character is like think about the think about the crew he's inheriting. And this is where, you know, to Bordy's point is T V, like how realistic is this that he's gonna turn a bunch of Joe Schmoes of the beef shop into a star quality restaurant. Uh but if your aspirations were to get a star and that's who you kind of got on your team, I'd probably be flipping tits too. Yeah. Yeah. He's Jordan, right? Like he's like we wouldn't remember the names Tony Kukoc, Steve Kerr, Luke Longley, Brian Cartwright, if it wasn't for Michael Jordan. BJ and like Armstrong, that's what he's doing Fox. for BJ Armstrong. I mean, even Rodman, like we probably would have remembered Rodman, but not as fondly as we do now if it wasn't for him. Or even Pippen. Right, like in Sydney's his Pippin, and he is taking these people and he's elevating him. Um, but to your point about like, you know, us not rooting for Carmi, I think that's what Bordy was talking about. Where it's like this show did no pandering whatsoever for the audience this season. Right. If anything, they went against the current, and they're like, we're going to go. It's it's like what it's very symbolic to what the restaurant is. It's like we know what you guys want. And we're going to give you that in bits and pieces, but it's going to be out the side window and we're going to do what we want instead. And I think that the people that created the show, everybody that's a part of it is proud of it and confident in it. That's probably where the audience got too big, right? Like this has always kind of been more or less like a niche. um, What would you want to call it? Like prestige television show. Uh, And the audience bloomed based off word of mouth, how, you know, enjoyable and good the first couple of seasons were. And then you kind of get some people that maybe that's just not their cup of tea and they didn't really understand, like, they just understand what they were getting into. And that's kind of, even if I just look at like the IMDB ratings for like season one, like, I think people are like, we kind of misremember the show. Like we're almost nostalgic for something that's so recent because it came at such a pivotal time. It's like right after COVID um, things are like, you know, it, it just came on the scene so fast, but like IMDb, like the first few episodes, 7.7, 7.7, 7.8, 8.0. 8. And then there's like a couple of nines in there this season. It's like 8.7, 8.8, 8.2. So it's like probably a quote unquote better show right now than it was in season one, but you're right because it's so popular. It just has a bigger scope on it. We talk about this all the time. Like the bigger you get, the more haters you're going to have. The negative um, voice but I mean, I still love louder. it. Yeah. I think it's fuck. I think it, this was an incredible season of television. I think so too. And I mean, yeah. I know you positioned it as like, I know you positioned it too at the beginning a little bit, Ralph, of like, you know, what, what is your clap back to the critics? But I mean, both these episodes are, are pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. I don't Do know. you guys have any comments on episode eight specifically? Because this was something I just, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I struggled with this episode. I, I didn't love it. Uh, that's ice chips. <laughs> they're, pregnancy so they're not cutting corners, Ralph. I mean, most birth, more, most birth scenes, you get to see the baby and you don't have to go through the whole <laughs> birth thing, right? Like, I, it's hard. it was hard for me to watch, but maybe it's that's just part of I don't know. That's just part of it. What I liked about ice chips and what I think uh, this show does really good is the 15-minute long scene, like in episode six. Oh, yeah. with Michael and Tina and then in episode eight with uh, Dee Dee and Sugar. Um, it just helps you get to know the characters better as opposed to like House of the Dragon where it's a minute and a half long scene where the dialogue's so choppy and I think the bear does the character specific episodes better than most. Yeah, they dedicated time to it. This could have been like, you know, five to seven. Like anytime I think of... um. A, a woman going into a labor in a show or a movie, the first thing that comes to my mind every single time because I'm brainwashed is Boogie Nights. Uh, it's towards the end of the movie. There's a montage, and we see Don Cheadle and his wife, and like it's like the most like realistic depiction I've seen of that. And then they flash over to Philip Seymour Hoffman as Scotty J, and he's documentary cameraing the entire thing, <laughs> and it's just like a laugh out loud moment for me every time. I just love that. And it's like that's 15, 20 seconds of Boogie Nights where I think that I'm just as, – as a 26-year-old dude, like watching a woman give birth, it's not at the top of my list. Like I'd rather see what's going on in the kitchen, especially after episode eight and the liked, refusal to – sorry, go what ahead. What I liked that was kind of nice after that page through it, but at the end where Dee Dee back to like the waiting room has been in labor with Shug for a whole day and it's just – the fact brothers just like comforting comforting her i feel like that was to comfort the audience well like you just sat through a woman yep. in labor 
let the facts calm you down a little bit. Let these two sweethearts kind of. I agree. No, that was great. Anytime we get with the facts is great. But like, I, I guess my biggest issue with it is like we haven't resolved the two biggest things that the season started with, and that is Carmi and Claire. Right uh, up until this point, know, it feels like they're just pushing it away, and then Sid not signing the docu sign. So I'm like, oh, so like they're just buying more time to prevent those two storylines from coming. I think there was a lot of resolution in this episode yep. between, as we've seen in past seasons, like Fishes, like the classic episode where you get the most fi- family dynamics, but between Sugar and her mother, right, and like kind of she's always this lingering presence that's like hanging over the kids. You know, Carmi doesn't want to talk to her all season. Suge talks about how she's created her own trauma or like situations that came from her relationship with her mother, uh, talking about how, you know, all the children were born. Uh, it was kind of fascinating too. You have Mikey, like, you know, it's kind of pre- preluding to, you know, suicide, right? He didn't want to come out of the womb. Then you got younger yeah. ever the people pleaser, uh, coming out nice and quick. And then you have Carm who's just going to fight, you know, the whole time. Uh, so, you know, there are some cool moments like that, I thought, within that episode uh, that continues to just build, like, the story around all these characters and provide those those details, right, that other shows just aren't going to give you. Sure, the backdrop, I would agree 100% at times, is, it's hard to watch because uh, it's just a little panic-inducing. It's very intense, very close-up shots of the faces. That's something that just all, like, already kind of makes you feel unease. Um, so, so, at least at the very end, we got my boy... Uh, Pete, you know, coming in, bringing a, a ray of sunshine, as always, just being an absolute sweetie. Love that guy. Just a big doofus. Always nice to see Pete come across the Making screen. Making bandos uh, as a lawyer, though. Facts. He's printing money. Like, he was out of town Shug for was, a good reason. Shug was driving the, a nice-ass Porsche, a Cayenne. Yup. She was whipping that thing through Chicago traffic, too. That's where I was like, oh, fuck me. This is too much. Like, I've been in Chicago traffic like that, dog. There's no way you're delivering a baby that in was, uh one of those episodes where usually when I'm watching the bear, I'm pretty locked in. Like it was one where I just found myself just like reaching for my phone to like pull up social media. Cause it was just, it's like, Oh my God. I like, it's hard. It's hard to watch at times for sure. Okay. Episode nine. This is, you know, I think we actually open on Carmi and the facts and the garbage. And they're kind of like walking him through what it would be like to apologize to Claire, like the role playing it. I love that little bit. Anytime we get, I like, I don't know if we, he had pushed it as much the first two seasons, but like Neil Fax specifically being like, yeah, dude, Carmi's my best friend with a bullet. I love that. That's my number one. That's my (laughs) ride or die. I hope I have a guy like that out there that talks about me like that, dude. Like, I love to have a dude that's just like, yeah, dude, Ralph is my best friend. Like, we'll always be best friends. And like, maybe he's like, yeah right yeah he speaks for me like i love that kind of guy um and we also get richie talking to tiff uh about the wedding i I miss tiff i think i think she's a great character i would love to have more of her in the show that's a great scene um, and then I th- at the park amazing is, scene. uh is this the ne- neil fax gonna play carmy because he knows his intricacies he's like i know his intricacies i i, I have to play him you can play claire bro yep yep <laughs> they're talking I about think claire's this is the same haunting. episode that sydney <laughs> claire's <haunting. laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like she, Claire's she haunting. Is, I, was like, I feel like that was finally like yeah. closing the loop on the haunt. Go ahead, Bear Forty. My bad. He was like, Carmen was like, no, Claire's the piece, and uh, is it Ted or Tim? He's like, yeah, she is a piece, <laughs> like a piece of ass. <laughs> yeah, she's a piece of ass. <laughs> I thought that was great, and it bookends it nice too because they go and actually visit Claire. I think at the end of the episode, so talking sweet, about yeah. Carmen's just too nervous to talk to you and she's borderline receptive um if you're claire and you're in this position are you willing to hear the facts out and like actually listen to them does that do anything for carmy's good graces or is it like dude you're such a pussy that you sent you know your two sweaty bodyguards to come do this for you i thought it was cute i think she did too she she seems like she has a soft spot for the facts and how couldn't she you know yeah. you know i see so that's the facts like one of the few areas where i see some some pushback like from people i'm like i can't get enough of these i need to, these guys ter- i need to spin off those are just terrible people don't like having fun you know who doesn't like just a couple doofus brothers right just having a good time it's some nice contrast of uh you know where carmy wants to go with this restaurant but meanwhile he's also got to stay loyal to his his best friends and keep them around you know 
they're smoking cigs in the restaurant before photo shoot day. They're just live. They're living just such a happy go lucky life. And then you have Carmi on the other side who's about to pop a blood vessel. It's just nice contrast of like what normal people who just enjoy themselves, enjoy having a good time. Claire has the throwaway line that Ted or Tim, we keep mixing it up. Ted or Tim, either one is just banging all of her friends. He's just getting it. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Dude, he's the man. <laughs> he's the man because like uh, Richie looks at him. He's like, why are you smoking cigarettes in here? He's like, dude, Sammy did it so confidently. I thought that it was going to be okay. <laughs> and then the photo journalist comes in in episode six. And he's like, does it smell like cigarettes in here? It smells like cigarettes in here. And they're like, no, no. What are you talking about, dude? We would never smoke cigarettes in here. He's like, it smells like cigarettes in here. And then he goes, yeah, because we're huffing darts in here, dude. <laughs> I'm like, oh, dude, this guy is just a fucking man. Um, but I think if I'm Claire, like, uh, you know what? Like, I like with with the facts that, like, all of these people around them, like Claire and Suge, have pet names for them. Like, they're always calling them baby and sweetheart and love and honey and stuff like that and it's like damn dude like these guys are really just like i I need somebody like that in my family um all right let's go episode 10 so this is the funeral called forever forever it is the funeral for olivia coleman greatest actress in the world and her restaurant uh i can't remember the name of the restaurant is it just called ever ever right yeah ever um and this is where we finally get carmy in his confrontation with the dude that's been living rent free in his head for three seasons of TV, Joel McHale. We get to see them interact and they have a conversation about what Carmi has been wanting to say to him. And he's like, I never really mustered anything up after fuck you. And I expected Joel McHale because the only way that we've seen him in this show is, you know, the devil reincarnate. I expected him to be like fiery and fired up, but he's really calm and relaxed in his response. And he's like, all right, is that it? I got to take a piss. And yeah. he doesn't think about it at all. He's literally uh, okay. J.K. Simmons and Whiplash. Interesting. Because I was thinking of it as the, like, you know, like. It's uh, like the exact same. Miles Teller's character is losing his mind and trying to, like, go to insane lengths to prove that he is worth it to this guy this guy in some ways thinks he's justifying his behavior by getting him to push to those levels uh but in the same way like both Carmi and miles teller's character and whiplash have you know mental issues or however you want to describe it from kind of the abuse or or the way they've pushed them uh in the end both become excellent at their craft but it's like the ends justify the means or there's there's other ways that he could have became this. It's like he has all these other chefs that we see that have been influences to him, right? And none of them are depicted as major assholes. It's only Joel McHale's character, but that's the one that lives rent free the most, and the one that he seems like he's most taking from in some ways, for better or worse, and the one that he wants to prove right. Like the whole entire dinner, we're getting everybody having rehashing these great stories, having like a great time, the funeral of ever. Didn't like how much Sydney was piping in. If I was there, I would have been like, hey, hey, hey. Come on. You're the plus one. Relax. Uh, (laughs) Who the the fuck are you? Yeah, right? (laughs) Who do you know here? (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Uh, But then you have Carmi. But, I mean, she served as, like, a a, whole time. She was, like, an extension of Carmi, yeah, because Carmi wasn't contributing anything to this conversation. But I want to stay with Joel McHale for a second because I think the whiplash thing is really interesting. So I coach basketball. I have seventh grade kids, and I talk about it all the time. Uh, different kids need to be coached different ways. There are some kids that need a positive, supportive voice, and there are other ones that want to be pushed, and they want to be yelled at, and they want to have fucking a drill sergeant in there because they know that's what's going to get the best out of them. And then there are other kids that that will only make them way worse, way more nervous, way more anxious, right? I'm curious if Joel McHale has the same approach in his kitchen. If he treats everybody the same way that he's treating Carmi, with just, you know, fuck yous here and there, or if he knows that Carmi can be so good that he feels like that's the way he needs to be taught because maybe that's the way McHale was taught, and maybe other people, other chefs in his kitchen, he is more supportive and positive for. I don't know. I think he, he tr- when he like, met some managers like in where it's their life. Like, you might just be some kid coming in for a few hours to make some bullshit but it's 
that dude's life. And if you're not going to put the thought and the effort in like he's going to, he's going to rip you a new one until you figure it out and you figure out how to care. And Carmi maybe figured out how to care a little too much. It's hurting. Like he said, it's giving him ulcers or whatever. Um, but I think season four will be a lot of him getting up because it was kind of his stagnation. He can't get through as a leader because he has this trauma. So he's got to sink or swim now. You know, you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Uh, you're going to have to baby your enemies a little bit because you can't just give them all trauma. You can't turn them all into you. You got to. You got to make it work. No, a hundred percent. Well, I, I guess it's a stupid question, but we, all right, let's say you guys are that fucking good at one specific skill. Do you want a Joel McHale or do you want an Olivia Coleman? Because I'm probably going to go for an Olivia Coleman. Well, I think the show answers the question for you. Sure. I mean, I love her. Can we talk about her for a second? I mean, do you want a um, Bill Parcells or do you want a, you know, uh, who's the Andy Vikings Reed. coach? A KOC, yeah, right, Andy Reid, Kevin yeah. O'Connell. Yeah, um, I want I want to talk about Olivia Coleman just sweeping in and uh, coming to the show. Um, she's one of my favorite working actresses. The favorite flea bag, just an absolute goat for me. The crown, um, and the reason that she's retiring, right? And her reason is essentially, I want to be a person for the first time in my life. Like I've been doing this for 30 years and I've sacrificed so many drinks with so many friends, so many dinners, so many parties. Uh, she started smoking cigarettes. Like as Carmi's quitting, she's starting, which I thought was hysterical a little bit. And I just like the fact that the show can pull in somebody like Olivia Coleman just for an episode like this. I think that's the strength of it. Like, I had issues with the John Cena appearance. So I was like, it feels like they're just getting John Cena to get John Cena. Uh, but when she comes in, it's like, oh, this is this is the one right here. I could I, if we had a spinoff about her and the facts as, you know, the cousin Greg's of this show, uh, then I think that would just be great because she's pretty much the scars guard of it. They're taking shots together at the end. You know, they might be building a friendship there. They might be building a relationship. Yeah, that party, man. That's just the definition of like a after work kitchen party where it's, it's the most random bunch of people and everybody's getting lit which is <laughs> stupid and then sydney just has to ruin it and have an anxiety attack like my beef is with her this season kind of <laughs> like carmy's an asshole but she's just kind of like being a little kind of a pussy like she's, she's absolutely being a pussy you yeah. won't speak up and talk Whoa. to carmy 100 yeah. i mean, Carmi, I mean sign. they're both at fault there there's, I mean, she's been dragging her feet, like, not all in this whole season. There's, I mean, I don't blame her because as we've chronicled and detailed, you know, on this show that Carmi is kind of losing his mind a little bit and becoming the, the chef that haunted him. Uh, but she's to blame as well. Like, if she wants to be a partner in this business, right, she has to be in, you know, they show her getting turned down, but she needs to hold her ground a little bit more and talk to Carmi less about why don't you accept my dish for this reason but more about how his behavior is impacting those around him uh, and something we skimmed with. i think she's tried that though like she's attempted that like do you see you see how big of a dick you're being and he's like yeah no i see it and then he just goes back and does it again and again it's like so reminiscent of like lebron and Kyrie in 2017 where like Kyrie wants to like be co-partners on the team and then she's got adam shapiro or brad stevens like whispering in her ear like hey dude you're really talented like you could just come do your own thing and build your own own culture over here. And she's, you know, she's thinking about it. She's considering it. And if, if I'm her, like, I'm getting a raise. And I'm getting my own kitchen, and I can create my own environment. Maybe it's I'm less about confronting, like, Suge, for example. Sit, like, wh why aren't you signing the contract, Pete? There's other ways that she could probably work, like, through this than just ignoring the problem and not signing. The I agree. Contract. But, you know, she's at a formative point of her life. Like, she just got a new apartment, moving out from her dad's place. Her dad is still having issues with, like, his uh, refrigerator his or something like that. And she's like, called her. He's like, yeah. Eric comes doing that noise again. I'm like, calling your daughter about. <laughs> like, what kind <laughs> of man are you, dude? 
but she's got a and she's I, got a confront <laughs> self like her like her uh, not pessimism like her shyness because um, even in where that her and Carmi are talking after like if night I think it was se- episode seven or eight and Carmi just gives her these bullshit apologies right he's like I do need to slow down a little bit I do hate that and like You're right and that's all he said he didn't say another word he just stared at her. Like, you got to press him a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, he's just going to say whatever he wants to appease you because Carmi, as confrontational as he is, he doesn't want to have the big confrontations. He doesn't want to have the big conversations, and that was you know? A great opportunity, it felt like, to talk about it in that situation, right? They both the just of, choked uh, it. They just, yeah. Episode nine, absolute choked it. Um, oh. It's. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I think we wrap up here. Well, um, uh, one, give, one give, key plot line, I don't think we've talked about it all. I just want to call it out there. I mean, we had the conversation with his uncle and him when he's, you know, water hosing oh, wow. down the front. Obviously, the bear hasn't been super successful. And we talked about this last time financially and whether that's from R&D. Uh, but I think that's going to be a big point of emphasis here in the, the next season. Uh, we'll see what happens in terms of their financial struggles. You know, the very end of the season, we kind of had that cliffhanger where he's getting calls from, you know, computer calls from his uncle. The review is out. It looked like there was maybe an email about a DocuSign. So, like, there could have been maybe declined or whatever there. Uh, so, it was all kind of finally coming to a head in that sense. Uh, so, def- we'll, we'll see. I just think that's a, a plot line that we just haven't touched on, but it's obviously – very important. I'm definitely going to tell somebody 100%. to take a long walk off a short pier. At least within the next <laughs> week, I'm going to probably tell Petey to do that. Oh, and yeah, yeah that, Cicero, that just a, a great kind of end of the season, putting his n- nuts on the table, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. I put you too much. What yeah. are we doing about it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I also like that, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Burnt, not the best movie ever, but uh, they had a little picture of Bradley Cooper on the wall at ever. It was a real quick flash. I kind of like the idea that Bradley Cooper's like chef character from Burnt exists within the Barry universe as well. Uh, kind of a nice little touch there. I saw that on Twitter like a week before I saw that episode. And then I saw the episode and I was like, damn, they, they stuck on Bradley Cooper for a minute. Is he going to get a cameo in the next season? Because, like, bringing in Cena is, like, one thing, but bringing in Bradley Cooper is a whole different other thing. Like That's that's a, a real actor right there. Um, all right, before we go, I need MVPs of the season. Who is the character? We have to, we all have to pick a different one. Okay, we can't all do the same guy. Pick your MVP for this season. Um, I'll start, and I will go with – I'll take both facts. Give me the fact, brothers. Let's go. Um, just – in a show that can be so dark and so depressing at times, they're the light at the end of the tunnel. Every scene with them is a hit. Uh, they're batting a thousand. Like, I, I don't think they missed from the field once. I love them, and I, I can't wait to see them again. Turn ahead, board. You, oh, I'll take it. I'll get, uh, give me yeah, Richie off the board. Uh, I can just kind of relate to Richie. I relate to Carmi too sometimes, but he's the stagnation this season was just kind of. I, I know why they did it, I think it was intended. Uh, same with Sydney, kind of being soft and everything feels intentional, whether you like it or not. But Richie, as like a single dad, is he plays this so well. And uh, his wife's moving on. She's marrying a rich guy. And part where I think Tiff goes, it'd be better if you hated him. And he's like, yeah, it'd be a lot better if I hated him because he does like the guy. Yep. Richie's a sweet, you know, and he's a good dad now. Uh, he's a good, he's a good leader in that front of house, uh, kind of the opposite Carmi in some ways, a little more, uh, motivational, likable. So I'm going to give it to Rich. Uh, I'll go uncle Jimmy, uh, kind of like the facts, but a little different. He's a very serious tone to him, but his one liners, uh, always crack me up. I think one of them is like, hold this so I can slap you. You know, like that's just like the kind of good humor I like to get from like, you know, you're, you've got an Italian uncle and then he's, uh, you know. How about where he's like, cl- he's, where can I put these golf clubs where no weirdo is going to touch him? Get your hands on. With yeah. all those and like, am I missing a club? Is that a club that's been up your ass yeah. for the last three weeks? Yeah, dude. Just he's killer. just a walking one-liner. He's the money, yeah. he's the money man, but he's got like that soft spot. Um, 
what a just yeah great well-rounded character I, I liked that moment between the two of them you know where they're talking a little bit about their grief and their uh shared feeling of responsibility to you know kind of what happened with his brother uh, his brother's passing and uh, that was just a nice moment i feel like in season one i never and this is maybe where some of uncle jimmy's character growth but like season one i didn't feel like he was as much of and this is kind of what he's probably com commenting on like i almost thought he was not like related uncle uh but more just like uncle and name like a guy from the community that they just called uncle uh and he's kind of grown to be more of a part of you know carmy and shug's life uh since then and um yeah just a wonderful character really funny uh every scene he's in he's a he's a scene stealer you want to be the guy those be are the my, fucking guy yep those are my one two and three for my MVP pete's leader definitely one, a so winner too with there. all that uh food he's got that was a you great know, scene pete's a winner. Head. he's uh, like can well, i cook the lasagna he's <laughs> <laughs> like trying to cook <laughs> everything and noise. he doesn't understand oh. like it's not the noise it's the smell <laughs> to wake everybody up it's not the volume, dude. Like, how do you not like? Everyone knows how a microwave works. They're all gonna heat up the exact same volume. It's ridiculous. Tina had a little bit of a more of a subdued, uh, I don't know, part of the season presence. Yeah. Uh, but episode six alone will can put her into the honorable mentions. She acts that uh, episode incredibly well and just gives so much more uh, color to that character uh, that you know you now have going forward. So give her an honorable mention as well. Yep, and we'll have this season four in a year. So we'll be talking about it again then. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, we will be back a little bit later this week talking about God knows what. And we'll see you on the other side. Peace out. Thank you, Chef. I'm loving the pop off.